Welcome back to the Core EM Podcast. Core content for anyone, anywhere, and just in time. This is the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue EM Residency Program. I'm Anand Swami Nathan. And I'm Andy Little. So Andy, how's it going? Good to have you back on the podcast. Oh, no, things are good. You know, winter's in full swing here in Ohio, so it's mostly gray, but there's snow on the ground, so at least it's that. And for the listeners, you know, this podcast is going to get released at the end of March. It will still, though, be the middle of winter where you are. Yes, it'll still be a little gray, maybe not snow on the ground, but yes, the uh, Ohio winters don't officially end till April. Yeah, it so. is a very, very long, uh, you know, I went to school in upstate New York, so I know, I know, I know yeah. how long winter lasts for. So yeah. what are we going to talk about today? So today we're going to talk about something that I think is maybe off the beaten path of core EM, and that's uh, the removal of foreign bodies. I love it. I love it. And which orifice are we going after today, Andy? We're particularly looking at the ears. You know, whenever you hear removal of foreign bodies, a lot of, you know, funny x-ray pictures come into people's minds. But today we're going to focus on ears. All right, great. So we'll we'll try as best as we can to keep our PG rating. We don't want that explicit warning on iTunes. That's right. Why are you so interested in this? You know, what are we going to really get into as far as removing foreign bodies? When I trained in residency, and I think maybe maybe you have some of the same sentiments, I felt like ear foreign bodies was something that a lot of people talked about, but wasn't something we did a lot of work on because they don't happen very often. But when they do, it's important to have a setup so we, where you can reliably remove them in a timely manner that works every time. And so we're going to talk about basically the do's and don'ts of who should you remove and then some techniques on how to do it. All right. Well, let's get to the nitty gritty here. Let's start with the classifications because there's a bunch of different things mm -hmm. that people put in ears. And let's be honest, most of these are kids putting things in ears, but you get a fair number of adults with things in their ears too. So let's go category wise. For me, it's first, I put it into two bigger categories, the things that we remove and the things that we don't. So under the umbrella of the things we remove, I think of non-organic non foreign bodies, these being small pieces of jewelry, you know, that little piece of metal that, that a kid picks up and puts in his ear or like beads um, is kind of the one I've, I've had a lot of experience with. And then the organic foreign bodies that fall into things we remove alive, which we'll get into in a little bit, or insects is typically the most common one. And then we think of the dead organic foreign bodies, which include impacted cerumen. And then when we think of pieces of food, particularly the ones that, that come to mind most are cooked or uncooked pieces of corn. So that's the things that we do remove. What about the category of things that maybe we should not be removing and we should be asking our ENT consultant to come on over? Yeah. So again, to me, this also has kind of two other categories. Again, we think of non-organic and these particularly are ones that, that, are, that we want to make sure we get ENT on board with, one being button batteries and then two being large pieces of jewelry. Another category within things we do not remove is anything in the set setting of a perforated TM. Let's discuss those things that we don't remove and let's say why, because, you know, we're in emergency medicine. We like to be able to do everything. I'd rather not call a consultant if I don't have to. So why are we avoiding the removal of button batteries? I think it comes down to the same reason why maybe we don't go after them in the esophagus initially without GI's help. And that's because when you agitate a button battery, it can cause leakage, which can then lead to severe burns of the inner ear, which cause more problems because you're still going to have to call ENT and then they might actually require additional surgery to fix the inner ear canal. And most of those patients as well, even if you can get the thing out, they need someone to take a good look in there and see if there's any damage that's already occurred. It's the same thing with the esophagus, right? You don't yeah. just want to get the battery out. You need to look and see, is there any damage to the esophagus as well? Now, what about those large pieces of jewelry? What's the prevention there for getting those out? So for me, my big thought is, is that these are kind of like a hand in a pickle jar. It barely got in there. And it's almost never going to come out as easy as when it did. And the biggest concern is, is what's behind that big piece of jewelry because you typically can't visualize the TM. And there's almost always a perforation with those just from size and space. And that brings us to your third thing that we shouldn't remove. That's when we see that there's already perforation of the TM. Yeah. And this one's pretty straightforward. Just in the idea that the TM, of course, is just a membrane across the ear, but it does um, have some of the inner ear bones connected to it. And if it's already damaged, we want to limit long-term damage to those bones. So if you see it perforated, call ENT. They'll take these people to the operating room. They'll be fully sedated. It'll be in a very controlled environment to where they won't further damage the TM. And that brings up two major points. One is that the patient can be fully sedated. Now, if you want to do a procedural sedation on all these patients, that's great to get them to sit still, but ENT can do that under anesthesia so they can really not move, which means you're not going to worsen things by mistake if the patient moves against you. And then of course, ENT has a different set of tools that we rarely, if ever, have stocked in the emergency department. And so they have things that can grab a little bit better and a little bit more firmly to make sure that you're not going to, again, mistakenly push that thing deeper. 
Now, the caveat on all of this, of course, is that you can actually get the patient to an ENT in a timely fashion or bring an ENT to the patient in a timely fashion. If you mm-hmm. can't, it may be best for you to do the removal. And again, this is might be a place where procedural sedation comes into play to make sure that, that patient doesn't move and worsen the situation. I think button batteries are one of these tricky ones because if you know the thing's only been in there for a little while, then I really do want to get it out before it causes necrosis. On the other hand, if you're not sure how long it's been in there, you might already have some damage that needs to have a look taken. And then if you use something to remove it, that might damage the casing, you're going to get worse damage. So I think those are very tricky. You're going to want to get those to an ENT, but you're going to want to do it very quickly. So now that we've decided who should and who should not get their foreign body removed, let's move on to actually taking them out. So when I think of removing a foreign body, it comes down to a simple four-step approach. So the first is setup. So this is not your typical procedure. I typically bring a lot of things to the table when I do these because I want to be a I want to be ready in case anything happens. So I typically bring multiple suction setups. Typically don't bring a typical yank hour. I typically start with a pediatric suction catheter and then even try to find one smaller. Um, most hospitals you can get a small little beveled metal suction catheter, and those are good for the small foreign bodies. Typically bring a couple saline syringes for irrigation. And this is depending on what I'm taking out, plus or minus an 18 gauge NJ cat so I can direct that all in one area. Typically bring a good set of forceps, some four by fours, and then a headlamp is a must. And then we think about positioning. So typically this is pretty easy if you can get the patient to do it. I just have them lie in the lateral recumbent with the affected ear up. And then we think of medications. So I this isn't just as simple as... Um, something to make it painful. Also think, does this patient need something to calm down? Typically in extremes of age, kids and elderly, maybe give a small dose of an anxiolytic before you do this. If they're asymptomatic, if they're symptomatic systemically, they might need some systemic pain medicine. And then what medication would help remove their foreign body? This is particularly for cerumen impaction, specifically Debrox or Colace. And then always think about lidocaine to anesthetize the ear and kill an insect if that's what you're going after. For the remove part, this is a very patient process. You want to be able to do this calmly because if you get excited and agitated, the patient will get excited and agitated. So make sure it's calm, collected, and that you take your time to do it. Andy, let's discuss specific examples of removal. So specific cases and how you would go about getting that thing out. And let's start with one that I saw not that long ago, a 25-year-old woman who comes in with a bug in her ear. I mean, that's what it is. They can feel it moving around. You look in, you see that there's a bug and it's still moving. How are you going to go about getting that one out? I focus a lot on adequate pain relief. And again, mostly this is typically local. So I'm a big fan of viscous lidocaine. If for some reason you don't have viscous lidocaine and you have to use an injectable lidocaine, 4% works a little better just because you don't need to give as much to get the the similar effects. Um, It numbs the ear canal. It also drowns the bug and kills it. It has enough acid in there to kill the bug finally off. And then I would focus on Uh, focused irrigation coupled with suction. And I've typically never had a problem using that approach that once the bug is dead, you just irrigate it kind of thoroughly and add suction and it almost always comes out. Those are great tips. I think these can be tricky because people will go after them with forceps, metal forceps. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That crushes the bug and that makes it much harder to extract. I've used a little bit of some Dermabond on a Q-tip end. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that works nicely as well. If you can get it on the thorax, that's a nice way to take it out. Regardless of how you get it out, you do have to irrigate afterwards because a lot of those little parts will be left in there and those can cause a lot of inflammation to the ear. You're going to get an otitis externa and then another problem for the patient. So regardless of what approach you use to getting that bug out, make sure you irrigate it well afterwards. Let's go to case number two, a 15 year old kid who comes in with a headphone earbud stuck in the canal. So I feel like I've seen this patient a couple times, especially with the earbud craze that we have among high schoolers. Um, And this one's are typically pretty nice because as long as you can get the patient okay with the idea that you're going to put something in their ear, you position them. And then these are ones I typically try to remove manually first with just a set of alligator forceps um, under visualization because they're typically a nice soft piece of plastic that's malleable. You just have to get a good hold on it. But the problem with this, if you can't grab them out manually, your really only other option is to call it ear, nose, and throat because it's either a comfort issue for the patient or it's, it's bigger than the space was to begin with and it just kind of snuck in there. All right. Here's a little tougher one. Five-year-old kid with a small bead that's gone in the canal. Man, these are super tough. And every time I've done these, I've had to just really kind of do it a little different, but mostly because in my experience, despite adequate pain control, it's hard to position these kids. Even with a good willing parent in the room, they just typically don't rest very well. These are ones where I sometimes will go to IM ketamine for sedation just because it allows them to relax. Because once you get them positioned, it typically isn't hard. You can either do a modified 
Q-tip with Dermabon, like like you talked about before, or you can just irrigate alone and it'll come out with suction. Yeah, it's perfect. Again, you're not going to try and grasp these with forceps. It'll never work. No. You think it will. You think, oh, I can, I can just, it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. Don't even bother trying. And the ketamine, I agree with you. Almost all of these patients, I've ended up needing to give an IM ketamine dose just to get them to sit still. Uh, you know, it's a five-year-old kid. Uh, the more you tell them to sit still, the less likely they're going to sit still. And once you get them to sit still, it's actually quite easy to get these out. The Dermavon trick is great. There are some little catheters that have a little balloon on the end. I don't have those available in my place, but I've seen these. Uh, I've seen ENT come in with these things. They're pretty cool. But I think a little Dermavon on the end of the Q-tip works great for these. Try not to touch the side of the ear because if you make good contact, you're going to get that Dermavon to stick there. Um, so it kind of takes a skilled hand. It's like operation, Andy. Uh, you don't want to touch the sides because something bad is going to happen. Now, I'm going to spring a question on you. What is the strangest foreign body that you've had in an ear that you've had to extract? So it was actually, I, I thought you might ask this question. Um, a mother had just gotten a Pandora bracelet for Valentine's Day, and her five-year-old had this idea that it would be cool to put one of the little trinkets in their ear. And so it was a mini Eiffel Tower stuck in the patient's ear. Problem was I could not get them ear, nose, and throat follow-up in a timely manner and had to go after it. And so this was one again where I did IM ketamine, got it out, and then unfortunately they had a they had a perf TM, so irrigated it a little bit, but then um, actually had to transfer them to a children's hospital because it looked as if they had ruptured their entire TM and managed their inner ear. But it was just the idea that it wasn't a straight piece of jewelry like we think a big bead; it was an actual little Eiffel Tower in their ear. So keep pointy jewelry out of the hands of young kids. I don't know if everyone yes. knew that before, but they definitely know it now. Uh, the kernel right. of corn, I've had that before. The dried kernel, thank God, because when they're not dry, it's a disaster trying to get them out. But the dry ones work really well with Dermavon. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that was the strangest one that I've seen because not what I expected to find in the ear. I've also seen, I had a tailor who came in with one of those little pins that they use when they're hemming your pants and he had oh, stuck it in his ear by mistake. And it was obviously quite painful for him, but it was actually quite easy to remove because they're so small. Once you yeah. grab them with forceps, they come out pretty easily. And when he was done, he was so thankful. He told me that I can get free tailoring for the rest of my life. All right, That's Andy, true. how about wrapping it up with some take home points? So for me, it really just comes down to three things when you want to remove a foreign body from an ear. And you could really probably globally um, apply these to removing foreign bodies from anything is first ask the question, is it something that you should remove? The second thing is making sure you take the time to set it up properly because like any other procedure, setup is 95% of the um, key to success. And then three, be patient while performing the removal because these might not always work with your first trick or your first try. Well, that's all for the Core EM podcast this week. Come on over and check out the site at coreem.net where we've got a ton of great core content emergency medicine. We'll have a core post up on Wednesday and a journal update up on Thursday. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page, follow us on Google+, and on Twitter where our handle is at core underscore EM. Thanks, and see you all next week.